Welcome to the party. I'm Luke Inman of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it's Combine Week. So on today's show, we're talking about the Vikings draft plans and offering up some of our bold predictions. Hey, this is Arif Hassan with the Wide Left Substack, another show without Luke Braun that makes me happy. I didn't look at the show notes that Luke sent. All that plus Ron Johnson stops by and it's coming up next on the Minnesota Football Park. Locked on Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota Football Party. It's the two-man crew. Plus, of course, we got Ron Johnson stopping by in a couple minutes as well. On today's episode, needless to say, I'm hijacking this thing. We're going to talk about some draft plans for the Vikings during Combine Week. Kwesi and KOC, they spoke at the podiums down in Indy. So what did we learn about Kirk Cousins' future and a potential Justin Jefferson contract? Plus, a new quarterback coach is in the building. What's that mean for the team? And the Vikings are top of the class once again with this year's NFL report card. All that coming up right after I tell you about FanDuel. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers are getting 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your $5 bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown today to get started. All right, buddy, just me and you today. There's a lot I want to rip through, so we got to be quick. No goofing around like usual. Let's get serious here. Yeah, and, and, okay, bud. Yeah, okay. Everyone's down in Indy this week, including yourself. So the A topic, I think, out the gate, who's the coolest person you've seen or ran into thus far? Oh, Jesus, that, that one's tough. Oh, man. Um I don't know. It's a bunch of dorks down here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it getting more analytical grouping now? The PFF nerds. The yeah, yeah. We got nerd. we had a, we had a couple of we had a couple of the nerds. I had a little bit of a lunch with some of the uh, Amazon Web Services guys, the next gen guys. Oh, cool. Sam yeah. Schwartzstein. That was kind of fun. Love that. Uh, you know, saw Eric Eager for a little bit. That's kind of fun. Love that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's 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 pretty cool. I mean, Charles McDonald's here. He's super cool. Love Chuck. Love Chuck. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a, you, you see everybody, and then you realize, oh, yeah, sports writers are pretty lame, actually. That's that's that, fair. That's that's right. How much would it take for you to walk up to Rick Spielman, CBS analyst now? I CBS know he's analyst. down there. Yeah. <laughs> walk up to him and ask him, how high did you have Johnny Menzel on your 2014 draft board? I can say this now because it's been so long. It's been 10 years. But in 2014, I'm not going to say how, I did actually get a chance to look at the Vikings big board. Like, it's the only actual Vikings board I've ever been able to actually take right. a look at. I saw the right. 2014 board. Johnny Manziel was top 15. That's right. That's right. In fact, I was there with you. And that's what's so yep. ironic and funny yep. is that we know we got a private sneak peek of their draft board down at the Senior Bowl. Who knows? Maybe it shuffled around a little bit. That was still six weeks before the draft. But right. you would know if Rick's lying or telling the truth and you could call him out true. when he that's says, true. oh, I had a yeah. I had a fifth round grade on Johnny Manziel. Just yeah, just can't, you can't trust that kind of attitude. Yeah, sure, Rick. Sure, Rick. Whatever you say, man. Who would win in an arm wrestling contest, Rick? You or your brother, Chris? That'd get a reaction. He would answer. Sure. I think he would answer that for sure. I think he would. I think yeah. he would. If okay, I see now you... around, I'll, I'll, I'll ask. <laughs> All right, now you have to do it. It's a bit now. Like, it's real now. You got to do it. Dude, I bet you he he knows you and remembers you from all those years. We went to training camp and the draft coverage at TCO. Oh you know, you were asking media questions in the media room at those press conferences. Maybe you can talk to him about PFF like you did Chad Greenway. Oh, that was a fun conversation with Chad. Because it was, it was right after the article was published. The title of the article is Chad Greenway's Bad at Football. Yeah, I was worried and, for you. Hey, Arif, yeah, I mean, what, hey, Arif Chad, can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> like, that, that doesn't happen to media people, right? Yeah, well, and he, he like he yelled across the 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 practice. He was like, "A reef, we need to talk." And I was like, "Because <laughs> I had just started like getting credentialed, right?" And I was like, "Oh, geez." And, and we know how it went. It went great, it went great. super nice, yeah, it very great. Crucial. But yeah. at the time, for those three and a half seconds before you walked over, was there? Yeah, a I was like, your throw, this, are we butterflies. Fighting? What were you yeah. thinking? Like, well, I mean, I'm it. obviously I'm like nervous, but I'm not gonna like back down, right? Like that's like I'm like trying to negotiate in my head, like how can I like <laughs> stand by what I said 
but also he's like six four or whatever, right? right <laughs> like right, I gotta, right. you know, it's a large human being. Yeah, yeah. You're like, I mean, hey, that- Baba Tunde Ayabusi, where he's at? I need a bodyguard <laughs> real quick. Yeah. Where's he at? Uh, do you uh, do you ever miss Spielman and Zim during these weeks, like down at the combine during all these pressers, or do you like kind of the corporate analytical speak of Quasi and KOC a little bit better? No, I, I I loved having Zim down here because he was so open about he was. things. Open that, book, and and he wouldn't necessarily like give the game away on a bunch of stuff, but he mm-hmm. would like there would be breaking news that he would just like tell you, and it's like yeah, he's authorized to like, but you like and you hear like his real intentions behind you know stuff like here like a lot of the times, especially with like a new round of GMs and coaches, and I see Ron just popped in. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're very close to the vest. They don't want to give anything away, even stuff that they feel like they could probably tell you. They don't just out of an abundance of caution or whatever. But, you know, Zim would be like, hey, we want to bring back Everson. We're going to do that. I promise you. And we're like, oh, promise? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Sure. You know, stuff like that. So um, I, I miss having them down here just because it felt like when they said something, well, especially Zim, when they said something, it was like pretty meaningful. And now right. we're like going through these pressers and they're, they're working very hard to say nothing. You're trying to like peel apart the threads. And so it's, it's a little bit more complicated now. Yeah, there was real substance though when Zim spoke for sure. And it felt like he was an open book to a T those first few years. And then after a couple of years, towards the end anyways, it was almost like he was getting coached up by the, you know, the GM or, or the PR, HR staff, things like that, just to dial it back just a little bit. But you could tell even then, he still wanted to, you know, be well, true. Especially at the and, combine, he was like, he was always a little bit more like willing yeah. to just be like, all right, well, here's the deal. Right, right. Don't ruin our draft plans. All right. Just don't yeah. give any any hints away. Let's bring in the legend, Ron Johnson, Gophers Hall of Famer. You can check him out every Tuesday on the Ron Johnson Show right here on the Locked On Sports Minnesota channel. Ron, we're talking combine, a Reese down in Indy right now. Um, any major takeaways from the KOC and, and Quasi pressers, I guess, specifically regarding, you know, their interest in bringing back Kirk Cousins, getting a long-term deal done with Justin Jefferson. Anything stick out to you on that front from what you heard? Uh, No, I mean, nothing that is out of the ordinary. I mean, you got the best receiver Mm -hmm. in football. Everybody knows that. So I think they uh, stroked his ego a little bit there to let him know, hey, we do know you are the best. You deserve the money. Um, And in the same breath, hey, Kirk, we got to come to an agreement. And they're like, we got to meet in the middle. So I think there's a little bit of uh, throwing some knowledge out there to Kirk as well, saying, hey, we, we, you are playing with the best receiver in the game uh, that a lot of guys would love to play with right now. And so you got to help us help you. Like you've made, you know, I think Kirk's made over $150 million probably in his career uh, when you think about money plus endorsements, all the stuff. I mean, piece of ranch. Come on now. Um, and so <laughs> when, when, when you think about, you know, pizza ranch, KFC, all the stuff, um, you know, the ability to probably uh, be a, 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 a force in the NFC when you think about, like, right now where they were last year, if they had had Kurt, maybe it's a different story down the stretch. And so I, I think for the Vikings and for Kirk, it's going to be that because going to a new team, not only are you learning a new system, a new offense, uh, new teammates, but then you're also – They have no loyalty to you trying to get back from injury where the Vikings will have some loyalty to him uh, as far as getting him back from that Achilles at the right time um, and then giving him what he's worth, uh, realizing like, hey, you're probably not going to be able to do anything seriously until August. And so when you think about that, I think the Vikings kind of said what they needed to say to, uh, you know, other than like, hey, we want Kirk definitely and we're going to pay whatever. They're not going to do that. Uh, and on the same note, they're never going to say like, yeah, we don't really want Kirk here. So, you know, I, I've heard people say like, oh, sources are telling me it's all but done and Kirk's gone. Right. Yeah, that that source is just giving you their opinion. There's no fact to that. Um, I, I did text Josh McCown and, and he's excited Ooh. to be in Minnesota. So uh, when he responded to me, I think he responded to me like this morning. Um, and, you know, he, he can't wait. He's like, yeah, I can't wait to catch up. Let's link up. I'm excited to be in Minnesota, blah, blah. So, you know, even even from that standpoint, you know, when you think about what that offense could look like with Josh McCown's uh, mindset of where he's been, KOC's ability, that you throw in Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson, um, I, I, I think – and then, again, that, you know, I think him and Kirk have the same agent. So there has to be some, uh, some, some ability in there as well to kind of say, hey, look, man, like I, I know we have the same agent. It's a business. But, look, I'm going to do my best to take care of you. So I think, you know, for a guy like Kirk Cousins, 
uh, I don't see another situation really being like laid out on a platter form like Minnesota would. Yeah, I mean, it certainly sounded like on the Viking side of things anyways, everybody wants Kirk Cousins back. And the only thing maybe holding them back is finding that deal that makes both sides happy. So do you think Kirk finds a way to lower his asking price and kind of meet in the middle? Because like you said, Ron, he's got to know this is the best spot for him uh, versus starting all over in a place like Pittsburgh or New England or wherever that may be. And if that means at this point in his career, taking a more team-friendly deal, even though that's not his M.O., up to this point, I could see him meeting in the middle and staying put now more than I did maybe a week or two ago. That's just my gut feeling all of a sudden after hearing the conviction in which KOC and Quasey spoke about him returning. So bottom line, do you think Kirk Cousins is back in Minnesota next year? I, I think he is. I do too. Uh, when you look at when you look at what like you said, like looking at what Kirk Cousins could be in Minnesota, looking at what Minnesota wants to do and how they want him here. Um I think all signs point to that, but at the same time, you have a look at like some of the greats, what they did towards the end of their career. Tom Brady every year, I think he only was making it. You can look it up. I think he was getting like a one or two million dollar like salary, and then like an eighteen million dollar signing bonus. And so, you know, is that underpaid for Tom Brady? Heck yeah. But what did Tom want to do? He wanted to win. So, you know, once you've made you know one hundred fifty million, you should be set for life. And so once you've kind of set yourself up now, because Kirk's gotten the big contracts, the big money, if you haven't won in that span, like guys like Patrick Mahomes and, and Jalen Hurts, you know, some of these guys are winning in that span uh, where Kirk Cousins has not. And so if you have not, what do you do? Well, I could go break the bank and go to somebody like the Commanders or, you know, somewhere like that or Arizona and, and not win for the rest of my career, but make a lot of money. Yeah, great. Um but there's there's a different side to that. Like, do you, what is your what is your value long term? Uh, is it about quantity or quality? And I think that's what you know. You can you can quantify money all you want, but what is the quality of your career when you look back on it? Um, also, Super Bowl champions can kind of do what they want um, after they're done playing as well. Like, you have a bigger uh, platform, you have a bigger audience once you become a champion. Uh, people want to hear about your championship mindset, what it took to get there. Uh, nobody wants to hear about, you know, mediocre seasons when a guy's done playing. And that's why a lot of these guys, when they retire, it's like, yeah, did you did you win anything? No. OK, well, let, let's move on to the next guy. And I think that's the thing. Like Dan Marino never won, but he set passing records. Um, I don't think Kirk Cousins is going to set any records um, unless he plays for 10 more years. And I don't I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, so when you when you look at that, you know, if you're not going to be the number one all time, you know, Drew Brees type and Drew Brees won, though. But, you know, Peyton Manning type records and all this stuff. Go be an Eli Manning like Eli Manning. Yes, he's tied to, to his to his brother, but he also won Super Bowls. And that's why he's able to do what he's doing now after football. So I, I think it's not just about like while you're playing it's when you're done too, setting yourself up for retirement. I pulled your combine stats up here, Ron. 96th percentile. Hey. In weight. You're coming in at 225, 6, two and a half. That's a healthy man, bro. That's a big, yeah, big guy. AJ yeah. Brown esque boundary alpha big body <laughs> catch radius. I want that guy on my team if I'm a quarterback. Yeah, I wish, honestly, like I wish if I could go back, because I always ask players out on my yeah. show, or I used to, like I'd say, hey, if you can go back and tell yourself something, I honestly would have told myself, man, like, be a hybrid tight end receiver. Like mm, I would have, I wish yeah. I had done it sooner mm -hmm. uh, because by the time I tried it with the Ravens, I was on my way out the door. So it was right. kind of mm -hmm. too late. And they had already uh, picked up a free agent guy by the name of Daniel Wilcox, who was going to play that role. And he was shorter than me and smaller than me. Uh, but he was a small, like 230 pound, 225 pound tight end in college. And so mm -hmm. they picked him up and he ended up playing, I think three or four years for the Ravens as a tight end. And I wish I had I wish I had switched sooner because by the time I did it with the Bears, I had already had two knee injuries. My mm -hmm. back was already kind of getting bad. So, um, yeah, I just wish I had done it earlier because I could have uh, like looking as a slot guy mm -hmm. specifically and then being able to be one by one off the tight end, just uh, creating something before it was created. I wish I wish I had done it because I know like Boo Williams, he went straight up from receiver to tight end. Um, I didn't want to go full tight end, but I'm like, ah, oh, like what the Bears had me doing, I wish I had done it earlier.
Was that before or after the Todd Heap era in Baltimore? Do you remember Todd Heap, the stud? Todd tight was end yeah. There? Todd was I was right. there with Todd. So like my okay. first okay. two years, I was primarily a receiver, uh, and then I got hurt. And then my third year, when I came back off injury, I was fine, but I just I didn't have like as much get off and speed. Like I felt like I couldn't cut as good as I used to, mm-hmm. and so I started doing more like like big big receiver stuff like i put on like i, I think i got to like 232 that year and so i was asking the tight ends coach because like todd and terry jones uh they used to joke they used to be like oh coach like let's let ron come in our meeting room and i would go in there i would honestly during training camp, go in their <laughs> meeting room and uh be a part of their meetings because when we went when we went jumbo elephant with four tight ends and Ooh, one wow. running back yeah we did four tight ends and one running back ryan billick um yeah, yeah, it was – and so I was the fourth tight end, so that was kind of the joke. It was like, oh, Ron's going to be the fourth tight end. And we only did it because what we wanted to do, honestly, was get Todd Heat manned up oh, for sure. like a, a safety or a backer because when you go jumbo with four tights, they're going to take corners out, mm-hmm. bring more linebackers and safeties in to kind of deal with the run. So if you don't do that, we were running the ball with Jamal Lewis. If you did what we wanted, which was you brought in your big – kind of goal line mm-hmm. we start splitting and you can go back and watch i think like if you watch todd heaps fade routes we were just splitting him out wide um so he honestly i mean that was 2002 so he was kind of like the sterling sharp before like gronk and those guys start doing it or travis kelsey like todd Heap was kind of the first like let's line them out wide and see what happens and he started getting linebackers covering them for the first couple games and then they switched it up and they start putting safeties on them and then they realize like on the goal line doesn't matter what you put on him. You can't cover him. Um, He just had back injuries, so that kind of slowed him down. But, yeah, we we went jumbo for tight ends. Uh, We didn't call it jumbo. I forgot we called it. I don't know if we called it, like, tiger or something. I like the elephant Um, lingo there. I like the elephant. Yeah, Elephant is a true thing. Elephant was, like, two backs, three tights. Okay. Um, Okay. We went jumbo, I think, tiger or something, or I forgot what we called it. But it was like four tights, one running back. Yeah. So, um, so Madden needs to install that in the playbook. They got Jumbo in Madden playbook, but they don't have the elephant Jumbo package. Yeah, gotta, it was a cool package. I mean, because we could go bunch that, on one side. Cool. We can go two by two where we're tight and two guys off the wings of them with mm-hmm. the running back. I mean, it was you can motion Terry Jones, who was our big tight end. He was like a Josh Oliver type, Alabama. He would motion to the backfield and become a lead fullback. So we could do a lot with that package. Um, and then, again, when, they, when they're when they going true jumbo defense, then Todd goes out wide. And then that's when it's a matchup nightmare. So I would go out wide. Todd would go out wide. Um, I would usually get the safety on me, and then Todd would get the linebacker on him, and that's Perfect. where you're going to go. Yeah. All right, two quickies to close here, Ron. One, you said you were texting Josh McCown. What's exciting about you know his effect and influence, I guess, in this quarterback room? And then two, just give us one guy you're excited to watch in Indy this week workout or a guy maybe you're starting to fall in love with for the Vikings that we should keep an eye on. So Josh McCown, I mean, we got drafted together. He was my guy. Like, we've hung out at the Super Bowl. I text him every once in a oh, while cool. anyway. Wow. Um, so he was uh, – we we both did the Hey Rookie, you're in the NFL premiere deal when we were rookies. Mm-hmm. And so I got to find that picture. But, you know, he was one of the top 32 rookies with me that year where we got to fly out to, you know, the Rose Bowl with Deshaun Foster and myself, Antoine Randallel, David Carr, um, you know, and so J- Joey Harrington was there. So that's, that's why I've known Josh ever since then. And so we've been kind of – in touch throughout the years uh whenever he would come to minnesota and then the super bowl we got to hang out and then of course like you know him coming here it was like oh perfect that's a guy i know i can go to the facility and hang out with him uh maybe he'll let me sit in the meeting rooms with him <laughs> um so i'm i'm looking for like because i never wanted to do it with keenan mccardell because keenan's cool and i got keenan's number uh and maybe i'll do it after josh like i'll be like hey keenan man i was in josh's meeting can i come to yours tomorrow like no, and they know I'm not going to go out and tell people like, oh man, they're running the trick double pass yeah. reverse sweep. Like, they know I'm not that guy. Um, but it's just it's just having more access to Josh and some of that stuff. But then the other side of it too is knowing what he brings to the table as just a young mind and a guy that really loves the game was a high school coach, you know. So he's worked his way up. A uh, guy I'm excited to watch, kind of I want to keep my own is Kalen King, uh, DB out of Penn State. Um, I like the pedigree of when you think about Joey Porter Jr. and what, what he's brought. And so, like, think about Penn State DBs. The last couple of years have been pretty good, kind of like Michigan DBs. And so that's why, um, you know, I'm kind of, and he's from Detroit. So when you think about Sauce Gardner and just, you know, uh, uh, Avery, I mean, Amir, 
uh, Ambry Thomas uh, from the 49ers. You got uh, Avante Maddox from the Eagles. Like those are all Detroit young kids that are now in the NFL. And so another guy in, in King, I just want to see, you know, I want to see, you know, is he all that they say he is, you know, the big 10 doesn't throw the ball a ton, but he did, you know, they did have to play Ohio state. So I'm going to go back and watch a little bit of that. Um, but yeah, I just want to see some of these corners, but he's one of them. I, I want to see him. And then like, I like the name Kool-Aid. So like watching Kool-Aid just to see. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. some great cool names in name. here, man. Kool-Aid uh, yeah. being one of them. There's some great. Yeah. Names. I want to see if he's everything they say he is, or because what we have to remember is Alabama's defense was really good. Um, right. So is he a product of the defense? Because Trayvon Diggs had got that moniker for a while, uh, which is why he wasn't like a top 15 pick. Uh, but then he proved like, hey, he's every bit of good as that, you know, Alabama made him into. So I, that's another guy, you know, when you look at both Alabama corners, um, they, it, it's kind of like NFL you there. Like they continue to have right. NFL products and NFL practices. Um, so I, I want to see those two corners as well, just because I know the Vikings need corners. For sure. Ron, who's your favorite? Wow, I'm old prospect. You got a lot to choose from. Guys that, you know, you played with their dads. Marvin Harrison <laughs> Jr., Jermaine Trotter Jr., Brendan Rice, Jerry Rice's kid, uh, uh, Gore, Frank Gore's kid, yeah. Joe Alt, uh, Chris Jenkins, the, the stud defensive tackle for the Panthers. Uh, he's coming out from Michigan this year, top. 50 60 defensive tackle Luke McCaffrey uh, Carter Bradley <laughs> Gus Bradley's kid uh who, who's your favorite though to just kind of watch and, and just uh, kind of think it's funny that oh wow okay this is I've already I'm already kid. past that now like I, I mean I, I got suppose. gray hair now so I'm, I'm I know I'm old <laughs> You're done. Um, it was it's it's been that happened a long time ago when I started seeing some of these other guys playing uh like college ball even like Anquan Bowden Jr's son playing basketball in college you know like I, I, I kind of already hit that number, but yeah, when I saw the grays, I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm officially old. I got them in the hair a little bit now too, so <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 old. But no, I mean, just seeing, like I said, saw Joey Porter Jr. last year. I remember playing against him, yep. him, um, yep. and Marvin Harrison. Yeah, I mean, I coached him uh, for a little bit. In, oh, you in, did in Indy. Oh, that's cool uh, for that two year, you know, span. And so his son, you know, I remember him being around, mm -hmm. um, and I remember he was talking about his son and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, like it's it's I've I've been feeling old, but you know, seeing a lot of these guys that I play with or against, and now their kids. But yeah, Chris Jenkins for sure. Again, he was another 2002 draft pick in our class because mm. uh, him and Julius Peppers were in that group. But yeah, seeing all those guys. I mean, even like Alex Brown. You know, he's been on the Ron Johnson show. His son's in college now playing baseball. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just I'm there. I'm getting old. Love it. He's Ron Johnson on Twitter at three Ron Johnson. Check him out every Tuesday on the Ron Johnson show, part of the Lockdown Sports Minnesota Network. And if you haven't already, go check out Ron's interviews with some great guests. Uh, who was it? CJ Ham a few weeks ago. Haven't checked yep. that one out, but I know you always got some great guests lined up. Maybe you can get Marvin Harrison on the show here during hey. the draft season. That'd be pretty cool. I don't know about that. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I won't set the bar too high there. Uh, that's all up, though, on Lockdown Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button so you never miss a beat. Ron, pleasure as always. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Appreciate it. Ron Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, always some good tidbits with Ron Johnson. What was your favorite little combine story there from Ron? He, he's got a lot, man. Yeah, no, he's got he's got like a ton. Um, I remember him telling us a couple of stories last year about like going to meetings and stuff like that with teams and how weird some of these teams would be. So I don't know. It's always it's always kind of fun to try and see like you know how has the combine changed? What's the same? You know what what are players' experiences? What do they expect? And him just talking about like you know back when you know I was at the combine, we would run like in the afternoon or something like that, which is like makes way more sense right, than kind of right. the situation that they have now, right? Which is like. You know, because they're waiting for prime time, they're waiting to run until like 8, 9 p.m. And players just don't want to do that. It's become such understand. a spectacle. He was right. He hit the yeah. nail right on the head. It's, yeah. it's such a spectacle. And we're, and, we're, and we're getting less data for it. It sucks. Yeah, that's true, too. That's true, too. All right. Coming up, we're talking about the Vikings' new quarterback coach and their latest report card. That's all coming up right after this. Quick reminder, today's episode brought to us by FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook and official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Right now, new customers, you're getting $150 in bonus bets when you win any $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets when you throw down just $5 on any bet. Right now, the T-Wolves, they're seven and a half point favorites over the Kings this Friday night. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on all the action. The app, it's so easy to use. And they got everything you need. Money lines, parlays, prop bets, over-unders, you name it, they got it. FanDuel's got everything you need to bet on the entire NBA season. And 
It's by far the easiest and simplest betting app to use. Go check it out for yourself. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on today. America's number one sports book. FanDuel, official partner of the NBA. All right. Uh, we kind of touched on it with Ron, but let's just get your final thoughts here before we move on. The other A topic story that seemed to get a lot of clarity from Quasi and KOC, which was, you know, the one about trading Justin Jefferson. He kind of squashed those rumors. You know, Quasi basically responded by saying, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically, I've literally never thought about that a single day in my life. He's a blue chip guy. The goal is adding blue chip guys, not letting them walk away. Went on to say that. They were really close to getting a deal done last year, but yeah. there's a reason, you know, 90% of deals don't get done before, you know, years three and year four. But more or less, sounded like a, a deal is imminent. It's just a matter of getting the structure right, which I get it. For a deal of this proportion that's going to break every record in the book outside of, you know, all the quarterback deals we've seen, I think that makes a lot of sense too. So just your final thoughts on, you know, the JJ comments and anything else you thought was kind of noteworthy from either of those pressers. Yeah, I think that there is, um, you know, a, a lot of skepticism from Vikings fans in general, just whenever a general manager talks. Totally understand it. Remember Rick Spielman saying, I have no intent to trade Percy right. Harpin. Before. That's always the go-to. You know, it's exam. always, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think that this is, like, pretty genuine. Just the way that they talked up uh, Justin Jefferson, like, hey, we think he's the best non-quarterback in the league. We're going to pay him like that. Right. We got really close to a deal last year. We got really close to a deal last year. You know, like, like the, the strength of that statement. Um, and then also like pointing out like, Hey, these deals don't usually get done after three. They usually get done after four. Uh, and so I'm like pretty confident, you know, that this is all going to happen. I, in this case, right. I'm not going to always like trust the GM on what they say, but like, first, I think that while Quasi is not going to be always open and clear about his intentions, right. Because it, it doesn't advantage him to do so. I don't think he's as willing to just lie. If that makes right. sense. Right. No, like, I, I think get that. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that when he says something, it's the truth. It's just very often we think he says something and he doesn't actually say anything, right? Um, so I think here, um, you know, that kind of the strength of that statement is pretty meaningful, especially paired with all of the praise that they gave Jefferson about how difficult it is to find a player like him and how much they want to pay him a lot. You know, like they gave up leverage in the conversation when they were just like, hey, he's the best non-quarterback in the NFL. We're going to pay him like that. Like that gives up leverage, right? Right. So I think that they're they're pretty confident about their ability to strike that deal. I think that, you know, we can say with a reasonable degree of confidence that there's a lot of optimism going on just based off of kind of that, the way that that pressure was handled by Quasi. So certainly I think that that's going to happen. Um, you know, I think that the future is a lot more open in the air when it comes to Kirk Cousins, mm -hmm. right? Like the way that they talked about him made it seem like, hey, we love him. We want him back, all that. That seems pretty genuine, but they would hedge their statements like, you know, they would say like 90%, like, hey, we want to bring Kirk back. It'd be awesome. We think he had a phenomenal year. We'd, we wouldn't want to leave after a year like that. We want him to finish his business. And mm -hmm. We think that he brings a lot to the team, et cetera. And then like the final 10% is like, but it is a business, right? Right. And you right. never know what happens, right? right. And you always right. got to prepare for what's happening. It's like that final 10% wasn't there for Jefferson, mm -hmm. right? It was mm -hmm. there for Cousins. Correct. Good now, point. I, yeah. And I do think they will. I feel like I'm now the only member of the Minnesota media that thinks this. I do think that they will re-sign or extend Kirk Cousins. I, I think do that too. That's, Did yeah. that change for you after, your, after hearing those pressers? Because I was on the fence and now I'm like 75%. Uh, it just the no, I was I was always I was always of that opinion just because of the the way that they talked about it. Like after he goes down, you know, uh, Kevin O'Connell says very definitively that he will be back next year. Like he just like says it right. Right. And Quasi at the end of the year is like we absolutely want to bring back Kirk Cousins. They didn't like they didn't really mince their words on that. And I think mm -hmm. that this is more about what Kirk Cousins can get and what he wants than it is about what the Vikings want and what they can get. I think that as Cousins is aging, because, you know, McCartney's here, he's talking to teams, you know, I'm not going to accuse him of violating the tampering rules, but I would not be surprised if here talking to teams, you know, he finds out mm -hmm. that, hey, maybe getting a fully guaranteed deal is going to be a lot tougher than you think this time around coming off of an ACL injury, right? And so I think it's going to be tough for Cousins to find what he wants. Um, and so I think it's much more likely that he'll end up 
I don't know if settling was the right word, but ending up back in Minnesota, especially I like I talked to I you know I I, I talked to a couple of people like hey does, is Washington like really you know on the table here is right. Pittsburgh really on the table Tennessee Atlanta are these teams on the table and while I didn't get a definitive answer on a lot of these teams and it seems like Atlanta is open to a lot of things right mm-hmm. they're open to uh, Kirk sounds like they're very open Justin to Justin Fields. right you know that's like the rumor right now is that it's Justin Fields which like you know from the Vikings perspective. That wouldn't be great because it means Justin Fields is gone, but it would be great in terms of retaining Kirk because it takes the team off the board, right? And it sounds like the Pittsburgh Steelers are are actually probably not that um, that much of a front runner. They don't seem that enthusiastic based off of my conversations, which were not with the general manager of the Steelers. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but you know, based off of what I understand, you know, kind of reading these temperatures, it feels like the Steelers are not going to be one of the teams that are one of the ones that are in contention to sign Kirk Cousins in a scenario where he hits the open market. So when his agent is having conversations with all of these teams, when he's talking to the Titans, when he's talking to the Falcons, and he's finding out the Falcons might be more in on Justin and the Steelers are more in on getting a guy in the draft, right? You know, he's finding all of these out, then it's going to be a lot more difficult for Kirk to leverage that kind of market to get the deal that he wants. Now, if Kirk Cousins hits the open market, he will get paid. He's a very good quarterback, right? He will get paid. But whether or not he gets a fully guaranteed deal – that's probably not going to happen. And in that scenario right. where an agent gets to fuel things out, it's going to make it, I think, a little bit easier for the Vikings to be like, hey, you're not getting that deal. Uh, we're going to give you a lot of money, a ton of money. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to get a fully guaranteed deal because you're injured. You're old. We want to get out from under this deal. If, if there's a situation that pops up where, you know, it's to everybody's best interest that you're traded, we want that to be able to happen without that killing our cap space, which a guaranteed deal has a lot of, you know, opportunity to do. So, I think that's probably what's going to happen is that um, his demands are going to cool down based off of some of the conversations around here. So if they do bring back Kirk, I think for a lot of fans, the next logical question then is, okay, uh, you said you were going to move up for Anthony Richardson last year, potentially. So are you going to grab a quarterback early in the draft this year to sit behind Kirk Cousins then? Or like, what's the plan there? And, and I thought there was something kind of interesting from Quasi who had He had one specific quote or one kind of one-liner segment at the end of, I think it was his first session. He was talking about the the COVID year. Somebody asked him about these COVID years and the older ages of some of these guys. And he basically indicated, uh, yes, age does matter. We do weigh that in quite a bit, essentially, into our draft process and evaluation. But then he said, quarterback is the one position, though, unlike a lot of sports that have minor league systems and the NFL doesn't, quarterback's Mm -hmm. kind of that one rare position in the NFL. You could draft someone and have them sit and learn like you would do for any minor league player in a different sport. And I don't know, my my antennas kind of went off a little bit. I kind of perked up in my chair a little bit and thought to myself, okay, so maybe there is a world where you do bring back Kirk and still draft somebody like J.J. McCarthy, who, of all the top quarterbacks, he's the one that does make the most sense to sit for a year and groom and develop from the sidelines first and foremost. But maybe I'm reading into that much. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, McCarthy is like the youngest one, right? So, so like, obviously. Okay. Yeah, right. right. So like that, you know. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds like, and again, this is not me talking to anybody on the Vikings. This is not me reporting. Mm-hmm. This sounds like the, the, like the rumor around here is that the Vikings are pretty high on McCarthy, right? Again, I haven't talked to any Vikings personnel, so I can't verify that that's the case, but that is... But there's some buzz. There's some rumors. Yeah, and so it feels like, you know, people are like, hey, the Vikings seem to really like McCarthy. Also feels like the Vikings seem to really like Drake May. And this was before the news about Josh McCown, who would coach Drake May in high school. This is before the news about Josh McCown being the quarterback coach had kind of hit our feet, right? And everyone's like, hey, the Vikings seem like pretty high on Drake May, which, you know, a lot of teams are pretty high on Drake May. He's the second quarterback in the class. But to hear specifically, you Mm -hmm. know, that that could be the case, you know, maybe the Vikings are thinking about putting together a package to move up. I don't know, right? Again, I haven't talked to Vikings personnel, so I can't report it, report it. This is like, uh, you know, reading the temperature. Uh, And so, you know, that makes it seem like, even if those rumors aren't true, that makes it seem like the Vikings are pretty invested in the concept of getting a quarterback, maybe sitting him for a little bit, but also reminding people, like, hey, if we don't get a guy that can start right away, if we don't get Drake May, who a lot of people project to be able to start right away, J.J. McCarthy, who a lot of people kind of understand because he comes from a pro-style system, to maybe be a plug-and-play starter, maybe somebody like a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix, maybe a Jaden Daniels needs to sit a little bit. Maybe we'll get that guy, and he's going to sit for a little bit, and everyone's going to just calm down, and everyone be comfortable with the idea that we're going to sit a guy for a little bit because you can do that at quarterback. We've been we've been seeing 
kind of a fair amount of that right now in the NFL, right? Obviously in the division with Jordan Love, famously with Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts. You know, these are all people that sat Aaron Rodgers, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that that is something that Quazi is attempting to kind of prepare people for. And that makes it seem like a quarterback is in really high consideration for the Vikings when it comes to, you know, figuring out either the first or the second pick of the draft. A tough spot to be in, man, if you're Quasey, because if you do push your chips back into Kirk Cousins, it's like, well, all right, what's the ultimate goal here? Win the Super Bowl? Then we got to surround him with as much talent as yeah. possible. We got to build the defense up. We can't afford to use this premium pick here, which we don't have a lot of anyways. No third mm-hmm. rounder, only two picks in the top 100. We can't afford to to use that on a, you, you know, basically somebody you're going to redshirt for a year, right? But at the same time, most yeah. important position in sports, Kirk's not going to be around forever. Uh, maybe it's only a, a you know maybe it's a two year deal on paper, but not fully guaranteed. So maybe it's really a one year deal. What is the future? And and I'll tell you what we've talked a lot about what Quasi and KOC have said in reading between the lines, so to speak. They reiterated time in and time out through both those press segments was that. It's not about just building a team for this year. It's about building the team for the long haul, being competitive year in and year out. And certainly, even if you do re-sign Kirk Cousins, that could mean drafting your new young quarterback for KOC to develop. So it's going to be so interesting. We, we've had these thoughts and discussions the day the season ended. And, you know, we're coming up here pretty close over the next few weeks. We're going to finally see at least that first domino fall either way, whether they bring back Kirk Cousins. Um, yeah. Let's see what else we got here. Last bit of Vikings news here. NFLPA released their team report cards again this year. Even though the Vikings slipped from number one to number two behind the Dolphins, it's been said those two teams are, quote, in a league of their own, end quote. Great movie, by the way. You ever seen that? <laughs> Tom Hanks, Madonna, yeah, Rosie no, O'Donnell, right. Gina Davis. There's no crying in baseball, Arif. You probably heard that <laughs> a lot growing up, I'm, I'm assuming. But uh, Vikings now, back-to-back seasons, though, Arif, seem to be the place to be, the hot spot of the league, at least when it comes to having, again, one of the best ran organizations in the NFL top to bottom, coaching, the facilities, the workout room, the cafeteria, the owners themselves. Vikes pretty much graded out high in literally every category. In fact, I think their lowest grade, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in any category was a B, and that was the training staff? Yeah, yeah. The, their lowest rating was the ninth best rating in that category. So top 10, every category. Yeah, top 10. so yeah, every category, so, top 10, top three, uh, almost every category. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah pretty um, much A's across the board from there on out. And, and you yeah. can take this in any direction you want, share your thoughts, but I do have one question I'm kind of curious about. Because last year, we saw this, we talked about, Okay, how beneficial potentially this could be for something like free agency. And, you Mm -hmm. know, if a guy is down to the Vikings or someone else that, you know, this maybe could help influence some players' decisions. Problem was last year, though, they just didn't have a lot of money to play with. So we never really saw any of that come to fruition, or at least as much as I thought maybe it would. This year, though, especially with the cap increase, there's a lot more money to play with. And so I guess do you foresee maybe a bigger splash now come free agency time? Not saying that they're going to go crazy with Chris Jones and T. Higgins and every superstar. I, I think that's dumb. Well, you still want to build through the draft. But, Let's find out. Let's see but, if we can do it. Yeah, but could there be a bigger splash because of these grades now, I guess, two years in a row? Uh, I mean, I, I think that that might be on the table. I think that also we got to remember, like Byron Murphy explicitly said that this played a role in him choosing to come. And Arizona ranked awful. I Terrible. think they were dead last Terrible. last year, right? Yeah. And they're 30th or 31st this year, right? Maybe you target um, the guys who come from the teams that are like bottom right. five, bottom seven, right. you know. Um, and and so, you know, that it does play a role, and I think that, you know, having that helps. But, you know, I think that a lot of people kind of interpret these grades incorrectly. I think that the, the, you've got a pretty good handle on it. This is not me talking to you, but it's just, I, I see this on the timeline. You know, people are like, oh my god, these players are whining. And it's like, it's really a lot less about that and more about you know, are owners putting players in a position to succeed? Are they reducing stressors that they're in control of? You know, do they have the ability to take care of players so that they're uh, maximizing their potential, right? And, uh, you know, honestly, these are job perks, right? And so who's providing the best job perks? Well, that's a way to attract people, right? And, you know, a lot of these veterans care a lot more about some of these categories than a lot of younger players do, right? So a veteran might care more about, like, hey, how well does the team take care of players' families, right? You know, that the Vikings, 
number one, in, I think, in the league in, in, in taking care of families, you know, in terms of providing daycare and benefits and providing spaces specifically for mothers and children on game day and, you know, having, you know, a bunch of ways to, to acclimate a family to an, into an environment. You know, a lot of older players care a lot about that. Younger players might care more about how good the locker room is. The Vikings, number one, mm-hmm. by the way, in locker room. Right. Right. And so it allows you to target a wide variety of players. It allows you to make sure that players, you know, if there's a there's a stressor that, you know, might impact the way that they the way that they feel about their physical environment that can impact their level of play, their level of intensity in practice. I mean, you take a look at that, the Buccaneers locker room grade. You you read some of the details. It's like extremely unsanitary. There's like leaks. There's mold. There's bugs in the shower. What are we doing? Come on. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my God, like even if, you know, they they go through that and they're like, oh, we've determined that, you know, this seems bad. This is actually more mildew than mold or whatever. These are not health That's risks. That's mildew, dude. Just the yeah, cousin right, yeah, yeah. of mold. That's but if, they, if they're like, these are not health risks, which would be bold for specifically the Buccaneers to say, yeah, you know, yeah. given their history. Um, but if they're like, we've determined these aren't health risks, it's still a stressor for a player. You're still not going to get the most out of that player if they don't want to go into the showers, like right? So, like, there's all of that, right? So it's a free agency grab. It's a way to maximize player potential. And it's also just like, Hey man, take care of your dudes, right? Like right. an NFL team is its players. Take care of them, right? right? And so, you know, it's like a signal that like this is this is something that like, you know, you can you can do as much as possible to make people just kind of feel good about working with you. So, um there's like a kind of a lot here. It's less about like whining and more about like, hey, another team is willing to to make sure that I've got good tasting food. It's not that important. Right. But the fact that they care tells me that they probably care about these four or five other things that aren't on the report card, right? The Vikings seventh tastiest food in the NFL, I guess. Right. right. And the nutrition plans are are the best in the NFL. They ninety six percent of players said that they feel that the nutrition plans are individualized to them, right? You know, uh, almost every player thinks that Kevin O'Connell doesn't waste their time. Right. Like that. I mean, that just that, that that is like just good to have. So I think, yeah, that'll help attract free agents. But I think the players that are here, it will also help them, you know, kind of reach their potential in a lot of ways that they may not have in another organization. So that's really nice. But, yeah, yeah. we might see one or two players that, that, that come in free agency that wouldn't have otherwise because of this report card. But that to me is only one of a couple of takeaways. It is, though, what you said. It's about the peace of mind, the comfort level these players can then have and use all their energy, right, on being the best football player possible. Not enough money last year to really see the huge difference. Again, you mentioned a good example, Byron Murphy, maybe, but maybe this year we see that even expand a little bit further. All right, we've got just a couple minutes left. I want to use it on the Vikings and their draft plans. That's coming up right after this. Quick reminder, got to go follow the Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button and on Twitter, give us a follow. It's at Locked On M-I-N. And remember, we're a podcast too, free and available, all platforms, Spotify, Apple, you name it. We got it. Tons of great choices over there too. It's your one-stop shop with endless Vikings talk with local experts. Ben Beacon ripping it up on the Locked On Wolves podcast each and every day. Of course, Luke Braun talking Vikes, free agency, salary cap, all on the Locked On Vikings podcast. And the Minnesota Basketball Party, that's every Wednesday. Sam X. From Reggie Wilson, Ron Johnson, Jack Borman. You can find it all on the Locked On Sports Minnesota channel and check out our brand new 24 7 live stream. Do us a favor, hit the subscribe button and drop us a five star review. Okay, rapid fire here. One guy, you're down in Indy, man. You're live. You're in it. One guy you're excited to watch this week in Indy. As it pertains to the Vikings, we don't need the entire scouting report breakdown quite yet. Plenty of time for all that over the next few weeks. My guy, Kansas Edge, Austin Booker. I know you yeah. saw him down at the Senior Bowl. Former Golden Gopher transfer, by the way. Would have been nice to keep him around this year. <laughs> uh, but but what he did down at the Senior Bowl, first and foremost, love the athleticism, love the length. I think he checks all those boxes. Still pretty raw, specifically versus the run. Still kind of learning how to rush the passer. But when I watched that size, the length, his burst beating guys down at the Senior Bowl the way they did. And by the way, some great offensive tackles and linemen in that group this year he went against yes. down in Mobile. Uh, great bend off the edge, though. I, I think... I foresee a lot of defensive line coaches falling in love with the athletic traits, especially if he does run well uh, and and as good as I think he will uh, this week in Indy. And and tying him to the Vikings specifically, 
obviously they need help everywhere on defense, but you want to talk about replacing DJ Wanham potentially. I see a lot of the same traits he had coming out. Uh, you shouldn't need to use a, a super early premium pick on him either. Feels like a late third round guy right now, maybe a little higher if he does crush the workouts. And I know the Vikings don't have a third rounder right now, but whether that's in maybe round one or round two, if you can move back, pick mm -hmm. up an extra third round pick, he feels like an ideal replacement to get younger, fill a need, give Flores kind of a new pass rusher to start molding. So Austin Booker from Kansas, that's a guy I'm excited to watch. Who you got? Yeah, I, I like your name better than I like the two names that I was going to choose because I'm picking two first rounders. Well, you right? got it's quantity like, oh. then. You got quantity. Yeah. I would call you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm, pick, I'm picking guys that no one is surprised that might do well here. I like Terry and Arnold a lot. He had a yep. great little press availability today. Compared, you know, playing cornerback to roofing, that's crazy. I love it. But he's got a lot of personality. <laughs> Um, and, you know, he's got a lot of length. You know, Ron talked about his teammate, Kool-Aid McKinstry. I think Terry and Arnold might actually be a better player just because, you know, he's – they're both physical specimens. I think Kool-Aid probably is a little bit more of one. I could be proven wrong here down in India. I'd love to be. But, you know, he's played a variety of techniques. He's played a bunch of different types of football. He's got a bunch of great instincts for zone and man coverage. I really – I'm curious about kind of how he'll test. I know he'll test probably quite well. So I want to see how he does. The second name, Chop Robinson. I know Luke Braun talked him up, and I hate agreeing with Luke Braun on anything. <laughs> In fact, the fact that he talked him up, I was like, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. So I look him up. I watch a, a bunch of his tape. You know, Luke Braun was was – was looking at the way that he was like, you know, attacking the run and was really excited about that, which great, fine. I want pass rushers. So I look at his win rate. Oh my God. Some of the best win rates in the NFL, 20% PFF win rate. You can look at it by first down, second down, third down, one of the tops in each category. Uh, and then the, I haven't the watched him yet. So what's the catch? catch we only have 148 pass rushing snaps this year. Oh, right? that's it. So oh, yeah. Okay. There's not a ton there. I kind of want to dig into that again. I haven't, looked deeply into a lot of these guys, right? And he was considered a first round pick at the that, beginning I remember of, of the of the draft season or the of, of the college season, dips down, moves back up in a first round consideration. Yep. A lot of talk about how he's gonna run a four four at his what? size. It's crazy. A what? lot of people think that he might break the two hundred and fifty pound plus a uh, record for 10 yard split because of his explosiveness. I'm really curious about his jumps. People think that he'll jump like 38. So he could be kind of like from a pure athlete perspective, you know, who's to say what kind of player he'll turn out to be, but from a pure athlete perspective, he could be kind of a quote unquote generational athlete, right? Yeah. Like in the way that Miles Garrett as an athlete was, right? Or Daniil Hunter as an athlete was. Maybe, maybe it's unfair to compare him to those two players given the level of success they had as football players. Mm -hmm. But as an athlete, Chop Robinson has a lot of a lot of people are talking about the way that he could really break down this combine. So I'm yeah. really excited to see what he does. And what I've watched and what what his statistics tell me, both of those things kind of marrying them together are really good are really good. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty excited about this guy. I kind of want to see more about like, hey, you're right. What is the catch? Dallas Turner is rated ahead of him. Um, uh, Layatu Latu is rated ahead of him. And, and Latu is probably not going to test as well. He's probably going to test pretty well. Mm -hmm. He's not going to test as well as Dallas no, Turner. He's not the athlete country. like these other guys. No. Yeah. Yeah. He's fluid. Technician. Right? Yeah, but he's a he's an amazing technician. He's an incredible film study. Jordan Rodriguez over at the Athletic wrote a really great piece about the way that he approaches pass rush, mm. pass rush, and he might have the largest armory of pass mm. rush moves as well as the uh, a, a better instinct for how to use those moves. So, yeah, which you don't see for rookie three. pass rushers. Yes, exactly. that takes so years to, to, to yes. figure out. Yeah, right. I mean, it took Daniel Hunter a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. so certainly he could end up being the pass best pass rusher in the class. No one would be shocked by that, right? That's why a lot of people consider him the best best pass rusher but get somebody like a chop robinson i'm kind of excited to see what he could do so those are the two guys that i want to take a look at just in terms of the the total athletic package that's only one part of the process i tend to fall in love with athletes a lot more than i think a lot of other people do just because you know these numbers are so exciting to me right um, right but uh but you know obviously at the end of the day you want to find good football players and it seems like both of these guys also happen to be that too so pretty well, excited about watching those guys yeah well first of all i like yours better than mine now after that breakdown that was phenomenal and and the other thing too is we whether he ends up being a good football player or not we've seen it every single year this is the time and platform these freak athletes like chop robinson are going to use mm -hmm. to boost their draft stock back up and get that buzz and that media hype and you'll see it on twitter and everything else for the next six weeks and you could see his draft stock kind of get back to where it was like you said, at the beginning of the season, him and his teammate, Kalen King, 
Both those yeah. guys were like first round guys when you went back and and looked at a you know way too early mock draft. But it seems like Chop Robinson of the two could be the one to sneak back into the maybe late first round top forty ish picks uh, when it's all said and done. Give me one bold prediction before we get out of here for this week's combine. Here's mine: Joe Milton. He's gonna throw a ball so high and far, it's either gonna hit the roof of Lucas Oil or it's gonna travel. 80 yards in the air. And he's going to be the talk of the town for about 24 hours. And Ooh. I think I said it, I think I said it last week, maybe two weeks ago. He's not a good quarterback. We we saw that again. He proved yes, it again in Mobile. Yes. But he literally, no exaggeration, been watching football and some films since 2014. He's got the strongest arm. I think I've ever seen in my life stronger than Josh Allen, which should be impossible, but that's my bold prediction. He'll be on sports center and Twitter and he'll be the toast of the town for about 24 hours after that. What's your bold prediction? Oh man. I'm, I've been looking at kind of the, who the track athletes might be. Yeah. Like, that's always fun. The fastest forties. John Ross. And, and uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Who's going to challenge John Ross. And I don't know that I'm going to go be so bold as to say, Someone's gonna someone's gonna stick something to John Ross's name there in terms of combine record, but we've got a really fast group this year. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not a draft guy. I'm talking to draft guys, and they're mm -hmm. like, "Hey, this might be one of the fastest groups that we've seen." If everybody runs, that's so important, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But um, we're gonna see, I think, five players break four three. I don't know who those five wow. players are, but my bold prediction. But there's that big of a pool of athletes. Track yes. stars. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, people are bringing up uh, Xavier Worthy, people are bringing up Nate Wiggins, mm. Anthony Gould, Quinion Mitchell, Roman Wilson, even. Mm. Um, oh, you know, if Quinion also... Mitchell runs in the four threes. Bro. Oh, top, God. top 12 pick, top 15 yeah. pick, which sounds crazy for a small school guy. He runs in the four threes, though, after that senior bowl. Forget about it. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that Nate Wiggins is rumored to have run um, a, a four, two, one, or something along those lines in training. Okay. Now I, I kind of dug into the rumors a little yep, bit to see yep. if you know there's something like there, it. and my understanding is that that's actually not true. So okay. you know, but the people have an impression and an understanding of of kind of who Nate Wiggins is and how fast he can be, and so it's on the table. Again, I don't think he actually did that based off of what I've been seeing and hearing and and who that who I've been talking to, but it's on the table, and I don't think anyone's right. going to break John Ross. But I think we're going to get at least five players break four three, which would be uh, bananas, bananas. Yeah. yeah, this draft class, and you never know. It's always you know beauties in the eye of the beholder and prisoner of the moment kind of thing. But this draft class truly feels like it's going to be one of the better draft classes, not the best, but one of the better draft classes of this decade. And and yeah, I'm looking at the running backs. No real burners like a Devin A chain from last year in the running backs. Well, mm -hmm. wide receivers, obviously Harrison's not running. Malik Neighbors is the next guy everybody wants to watch but as far as burners you mentioned it Xavier Worthy for sure at the top of the list Troy Franklin he's supposed to be a burner yeah, uh, Xavier Leggett didn't look as fast as what we thought he was going to be down at the senior mm -hmm. bowl never know though sometimes you get these guys out of the pads and maybe with some of that track background he ends up burning it up as well but those are definitely a couple of the names at least in the wideout department to keep an eye on for sure um, yeah I know I right. know a couple of people have predicted Leggett to also break 4-3 I think it was a good oh really okay yeah. yeah we'll see uh, that was fun, man. Great stuff per usual. We've got to get out of here so you can go track down Rick Spielman and PA, <laughs> pretend to watch some workouts now. Did you at least bring the binoculars, a stopwatch? Please tell me you did that for the bit. Oh, you know I brought the binoculars. You know <laughs> I brought the really? binoculars. Yeah. I, would, I would pay good money for a picture in the stands, you by yourself with Belichick passing the popcorn, some old stale popcorn back and forth with of binoculars. Course, yeah. man, that would be phenomenal. Um, all right, that's a wrap today. Remember, like, rate, review, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Join us every Monday, every Thursday for another episode of the Minnesota Football Party. It's your one-stop shop breakdown of everything Minnesota Vikings. That's Arif Hassan on Twitter, at Arif Hassan NFL. Check out all his work over at the Wide Left Substack. Thanks for tuning in to the Minnesota Football Party, part of the Locked On Sports Minnesota Network. We're back to tomorrow with the round table with Kara Levis, Reggie Wilson and Julia Daniels. But until then I'm Luke Inman on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman signing out.